Hello everybody and welcome back. We are in Thermo 2 now, Apply Thermodynamics. And we are in Chapter 10, Gas Power Cycles. It's going to be fun, so let's get right to it. Okay, so first off we have to set some ground rules when we're looking at gas power cycles because the key word here is cycle. We're going around from one state to the other, coming all the way back to our original state. And hopefully, hopefully doing something useful while we do that. So, most power producing devices operate on these cycles, okay? And we got some different little details we need to define. First off, most of the time we're talking about ideal cycles. Ideal simply says that, well, it's ideal. We're not taking into account a lot of the irreversibilities. We're assuming that it's internally reversible, okay? It's as close to reality as we can get, but we're saying it's isentropic, isothermal, all these things that sound really, really nice, but we don't actually see in reality. We get close, it's just not perfect. Okay, now, why do we do this? Why do we have look at ideal cycles instead of the real world? Well, the reason for that is because reversible cycles, like the Carnot cycle, which we're gonna learn about, they have the highest thermal efficiency. Now, if they're the highest, what that means is that when we're looking at this ideal cycle right here, Whatever we do is going to be less efficient than that. So the power output from this you know, ideal cycle is going to be more than the power output from our actual cycle. The efficiency of our ideal cycle is going to be more than the efficiency of our actual cycle. And so what this does is it gives us an upper limit. This is ideal. This is where we are. So if we need something up here, that can't happen. So whenever we're making our calculations, whenever we're looking at different cycles, we're figuring out from this what the ideal world is, and we're saying, okay, we're less than that. And if my particular application needs less than the ideal power, or less than the you know, ideal efficiency, and it's still good, I can move forward. If it doesn't, then I have to figure out how I can mess around with my parameters, which we're going to learn, to get more power out of it, to get more um, efficiency out of my system. Okay, and here's our basic equation which we're going to use all the time and it simply says that our thermal efficiency is equal to our network over the heat input, okay? I have a certain amount of heat I put in. I'm trying to see how much of that actually goes to work, okay? And this is network because some of my work is always used to keep my cycle going. So that'll be the work of the turbine minus the work of the compressor in many of our cycles. The compressor keeps the cycle going and the turbine is the one that actually produces power. So we have to power the compressor, the turbine gets power. And so if we know how much the difference between that is and we know how much heat we put in here, well glorious, we have our answer for how efficient our cycle is. So the more efficient our compressors can be at compressing things and less energy they take, and the more efficient our turbines can be at removing heat and energy from the cycle, the better it is. Okay, now here's a good example for why we do this. Now, if I'm looking at an oven, I'm trying to cook a potato, you know, I'm hungry, I stick a potato in there. If it was me, I'd probably have cut it open and add some butter. Butter, that'd be good, that'd be good. But when I'm doing my calculations, I can try to figure out exactly all the idiosyncrasies of this potato. That's enormously complex. For one, while that potato might look very homogeneous on the inside after cooking it, it's got a lot going on. For one, it's not a perfect shape. It's all this kind of crazy roundness. Two, what about the little eyes that you have to cut off? Those are going to be changing things as well. There might be dirt on it. There might be water on it. There's a lot of different things that are going to make it more complex. But if I'm just trying to cook the potato, I can assume that it's mostly water. So I'd idealize it. I'd say, okay, potato, you are now 100% water. You were like 70% water, 80% water before. Now you're 100% water. How long would it take me to cook water to 175 degrees Celsius? Well, if I find that to be two minutes for water, then I'm probably gonna set it to two minutes and eight seconds for a potato. And that's just assuming that I have to do it a little bit longer because potato is not actually 100% water. Cool. So ideal sit situation makes it really easy to calculate. Actual, well, it's not going to be perfect, so I need to give it more power. I have to 
give it more energy to get the same effect as my ideal cycle. Okay, now ideal cycles are internally reversible, okay? But unlike the cardinal cycle, they're not necessarily externally reversible. Externally reversible. Why? Well, because we're always going to be losing some sort of energy somewhere, okay? We're going to be losing something somewhere. Now, an ideal cycle is usually less efficient than a perfectly Carnot reversible cycle. Now, why is this your life but ideal? I thought we were making things ideal, so why isn't it perfect? Well, the reason for that is quite simple. I showed you the little diagram, and it showed like this is our actual cycle, something like this, and we idealized it. Okay? So our ideal cycle, yes, we're making it as perfect as possible. We're making it as perfect as possible such that it follows our actual cycle closely, okay? We made it a lot of straight lines or isotherms or whatever we need to do, but we're still following the actual cycle's parameters. Like a Carnot cycle, which is the absolutely most efficient cycle, looks like this. It's just a box. Now, there's an issue. My actual cycle does not look like the Carnot cycle. It's not practical to build an engine that runs on the Carnot cycle. It just doesn't work. Um, and so, while this guy right here is the world's absolute most efficient possibility, since I can't actually build that inside of my car, I don't use that. And so that's why our ideal situation here is not going to be as efficient as things like the Cardinal Cycle, which is a perfect, absolutely amazing um, cycle. Because I can't practically build the Cardinal Cycle. So it follows the actual one. Oh. Okay. Now, here are some different things we have to take into account with our ideal cycles. First off, no friction. Second, expansion and compression, we're talking about the turbine and the compressor, happen in a quasi-equilibrium manner, which means we're assuming it's happening very, very slowly and at an equilibrium every little step of the way, which makes it, makes it isentropic. Okay, We're just more or less assuming isentropic here. And we're saying that there's no heat transfer in any of the components except for where I want it. We do reject heat at some point. We do input heat at some other point. But everywhere else, we're saying no heat is lost. Okay. Now, here is what I think is absolutely super cool about all these diagrams. Now, we learned that our thermal efficiency is equal to our network over our heat in. And the amazing thing is you can actually do that just by looking at these diagrams. So this area right here, that is my network. You're like, what? It is, it actually is my network. So the amount of energy that I have gotten out is technically this area right here. Okay, that's the amount of energy I output from my turbine. However, it takes this much energy, this box right here, to keep my compressor going. Now, okay, so I have my network, that's this area right here. Now the cool thing is the amount of heat input is everything under this top line, okay? So in this diagram, it looks like this. Everything under this top line. Don't know which diagram I'm gonna look on. And so if I know one area, and I know the other area, I can actually solve my thermal efficiency just from the data, which in real life I would probably do because I wouldn't have necessarily these nice little numbers, and I could do it numerically. Numerics is amazing, everybody. Engineers work with numerics. Okay, up. Oh, that's in this section. So next time we're going to be going into the Carnot cycle and why we even care about it. So I'll see you all in a little bit. Have a great day. Bye-bye.